So this segment of the first week of classes is going to deal with machine language. I'm going to introduce you briefly to the software stack that runs on top of an operating system and all the instructions that are used to control the hardware, both at the operating system level and at the user application level. Okay, And so we're going to briefly go through step-by-step uh, -step as to how these programs actually run and the different modes in the system when operating. Uh, the machine language. Uh, most of you must be have taken a computer architecture course or a compiler course. Essentially, every type of processor has its own instruction set. Each instruction in an instruction set does, does something unique. Um, you know, add pieces of data, uh, arithmetic operations. There are special operations that write to I/O devices. For example, you want to write something out to the screen. Uh, there's a specific instruction that puts out the data that you want out into that port. And each of these instructions is represented by a unique number. Uh, this number may be different for different instruction set, but no two instruction sets, no two instructions in the same instruction set should have the same number. Machine language programs are simply a collection of these instructions. Again, each instruction is represented by a number. When you run this, these uh, numbers, they essentially convert to binary because that's what the system understands, and that's what the hardware understands. And then there's assembly language. Assembly language essentially takes these machine language and throws in mnemonics. So if you have an add instruction identified as number 63, then it's pretty hard uh, for people generating code to understand that. And so in the past, assembly languages have mnemonics, such as an ad, which you know, implicitly that textual representation uh, seems to convey something about what the instruction itself does. And these are used to replace the numbers that identify these instructions, and this is what the compiler generates. The assembly code is essentially a text file, so when you, when, what the compiler generates from the program that you write in C or C++ or Java is a text file with a collection of these mnemonics. And then these mnemonics are the ones that get translated into binary before they finally run on the machine. And above these uh, assembly languages lie your computer languages, right? So you've got uh, high-level languages like C, C++. Uh, there are lots of scripting languages uh, that people use these days. Um, and these are interpreted or compiled down into assembly language. So the job of the compiler or the interpreter is to take your high-level language and then translate it to assembly, which ultimately runs on the machine. And most of the software that we know today is written in the computer languages, including the operating system. You will see that you during the assignments that a lot of the modifications you'll be making is just to the C part of, the, of Linux. Uh, there's not a lot of assembly that's actually thrown in there. So there are... That part of the operating system is a very small fraction, the assembly part. The reason is that code needs to be portable. You don't want a lot, it's very hard to get assembly code right, and so you don't want a lot of people uh, touching that part of the subsystem. So you want to modify the operating system schedule. You don't ever see any of the assembly code at all, even though there's a lot of assembly code routines uh, that you call into to make the thing actually happen. But it's all hidden underneath uh, functions, and you don't really deal with it. So now back to the one of the things when you have multiple user applications running at the same time on the machine is how do you make sure that they don't trample upon each other? How do you guarantee that they're not going to monopolize the machine? How do you make sure that they don't take control of the hardware and do not relinquish it to anyone else? So the way that systems have dealt with is based on this notion of privilege of separation. Privilege of separation is you go down along the tasks that a system needs to provide in order to run a particular program, and then you split it. You, you create a hierarchical chain of um, levels you got to go through, levels of software you got to go through uh, in order to get the program to actually run. And most systems, there could be more than two, but most systems have at least two levels. So they have a user mode and they have a kernel mode. 
all or most application software really runs in user mode. That is, they do not have direct access to the hardware. So the operating system is the one that runs in kernel mode, or also known as supervisor mode in some systems. Okay? And when you run in supervisor mode, you have complete access to all the instructions. So all the instructions that you have that the hardware provides, for example, to write to the frame buffer, to write to I.O. devices, all of these instructions are available. When you run in the user or application software mode, then you don't have access to all the instructions. An example of this would be an out instruction. So an out instruction is one that puts out data onto an I.O. device buffer. So if an application software had direct control over this, then when it runs, it could put anything it wants onto the screen which you don't want, and you want the we want the operating system to coordinate all the different windows from different applications, right? So that's an example. Uh, that's an example of an instruction that is available only to the operating system, okay? There are other ones such as uh, telling the CPU what thread is running on it, things like that, that also the operating system controls so that your application doesn't monopolize the CPU. Right? It doesn't cheat and give itself more time. So. If you have applications running in user mode and you have the kernel itself running in the, the OS runs in the kernel mode, then the question is how do these two go between the two of them? So how do they interact with each other? Right? So how do they go between them? So the way this is done is through a notion called um, system calls. So system calls is a notion that you use to go between the application and the OS. And the application software running in user mode makes these system calls. So system calls are from the application to the OS. Right? It's, it's a one-way thing. It's, it's not the other way. It's not that the op operating system calls into the application system calls. It's the application calling to the into the operating system and system calls. Uh, we'll go through in detail as to how these system calls are, but essentially they are well-defined interfaces. So Linux, for example, probably provides a thing at this point, 263 of these. An example of a system call uh, would be create. So create is a call that creates a file on your disk, and create, and if an application wants to create a file, then it can call into the OS to do so. And system calls essentially for the time being, you can think of it as function calls, except that these functions reside within the operating system, which is not in kernel mode. Okay? And user mode programs use these system calls to provide a lot of different uh, duties, or they extract a lot of different um, functionality from the OS. Okay? So let's just go through briefly how system calls in general work. To do that, first thing you got to understand is just this overall mode hierarchy. right? So we've got two modes, user mode, kernel mode. You've got application and application interface system libraries, right? So, for example, when you call printf um, in your C or C++ program, or C program mostly, or C out in C++, then it first calls into a library that is going to provide a buffer to buffer all the C out statements from a program. And then, finally, it's going to call into the operating system to do its thing. So. Really, the printing operation is provided through a conjunction of system libraries and the operating system, right? It's not just the operating system doing it. It's not just all done in user land. It cannot be done all in user land. And so the reason this split exists is so that you want to keep only the most privileged or at most, most um, important functions in the operating system. You don't want to keep anything more than what's required. Because if you do so, then there's a lot of junk that's going to go into the operating system, right? So, and more code that is in the operating system, the more likelihood of there being a bug. So, privilege separation not only thinks about um, what functionality reads to not on which level, but it also thinks about what's the least amount of functionality needed at each level, right? So you want to keep only the most essential functions in the operating system and nothing more, okay? And the system libraries are also essentially run as service processes. 
So these processes, when your machine boots up, even if you don't have any program of your own running on it, it starts up these processes automatically, and they're all running all the time, and you know they're running in the background. And when you actually make a system call, they come into operation, right? So then it goes through system interface uh, libraries, and before they go into the operating system. Okay. Just a word of caution: some operating systems may not uh, be have a clear separation between kernel and user mode. And examples of these would be things like embedded systems in the past, like uh, your IPAC, right? So mostly these are used when the, there's a single vendor that's putting out the hardware and the applications. So it's only a fixed set of applications running on a specific hardware. In this, these cases, um, the system is completely run as one level, right? So the use, there is no user mode kernel mode. They're both boxed into one, right? So these would be, and if you have an embedded OS, um, uh, then this, this would be the case. Uh, and so these are not um, used, in, uh, used as often these days because it, they restrict portability a lot. Because then you can have only applications from one vendor, right? So smartphones, even smartphones these days essentially have a two um, level hierarchy where they have user applications. Um, and running on top of a standardized kernel, right? So if you have, because user applications are not distributed by Apple or Google, right? They come from independent developers, which who you trust to a certain extent, but if their code is buggy or even if there's a flaw in their code, then the operating system is not compromised. Your phone does not stop working because one application crashed, right? That would be pretty bad. So the next thing we're gonna look at is how do system calls actually work? So you have a conventional, you got to read this figure left to right. So you've got a conventional user process. Okay, this is step one. When it wants anything useful uh, from the operating system, then it makes a call into this, it calls a specific function name. Right? Like I said, there are 263 of these in Linux, and you could you make one of these function calls. When you do that, what happens is an, an operation called trap happens, okay? So this happens entirely in hardware. So this is step three. So in step three, the hardware essentially moves this program from running in user mode to running in kernel mode. So it makes the transition in this direction, okay? And the reason it does this is when the system call starts, you're running in user mode, which is identified by a flag bit. And when when the system call is about the system call itself is about to run, you want it to be running in kernel mode. So you need the hardware to make a switch from the user mode to kernel mode. The reason this is done in hardware is if it was available to user programs to do, then essentially any program itself would upgrade itself to user OS privileges, right? And hence get control of the overall system. But you don't want that. And hence this separation exists where it's the the application makes the system call, but it's the hardware um, that actually makes the transition, okay? So this step is all in hardware. Then the system call itself is run. So this is all OS. So this is all whatever language you, you wrote the OS in. In Linux, this case, it's C. So you run the system call itself, and one example could be as simple as uh, what process ID am I? In this case, the operating system does a simple lookup on a variable where it stored your the threads or the processes ID, returns that. And when it returns, the last call it makes is what's known as an RTI. So this is called a uh, return from trap. Okay? And again, in this point, the hardware is involved. So the hardware is involved when it gets in, the hardware is involved when it gets out. Okay? And when you return from the interrupt, um, you get back to where the program left off. So it, it, with system calls, so this is step four, right? So with system calls, you make this transition into the OS, and then this program stops running, and then the OS at some point is going to get back and say the system call is done, and then the program starts running again, okay? So this whole thing is delayed. So your program essentially is waiting for the system call to complete. And if system calls take a long time, then this is going to be a big slowdown on your program. 
So most operating systems try to separate out system calls that run really fast from system calls that run really slow. For example, asking for my process ID is much faster than creating a file on the disk. And so there has to be careful there has to be careful ch check uh, of these system calls themselves from the operating system build as to figure out which ones take a long time, which ones don't take a long time. In general, you want all of them to take shot, right, the shortest time possible. Uh, but this is not always the case. And then there's the overhead of this these traps, right? So the, the movement from the user to kernel and then back from kernel to user mode. This is not cheap necessarily. In the old system, this used to take 500 cycles or so. Um, and this, if, if for comparative purpose, an ad operation takes one cycle, right? So if you have a uh, program that just does counter plus plus, then that's a lot of overhead. In the newer systems, um, the operating system, uh, the hardware f folks have changed some of these trade-offs. And so they have gone through things carefully and figured out some system calls which could be made faster. So they provide a faster trap mode. So that takes about 80 or 90 cycles. And then they have slower trap modes that take much longer. So just to reiterate of the overall hierarchy, you have your user mode applications, which consist of your applications, as well as standard libraries, such as your compiler, system libraries like printf, libc, and you've got your shells and commands. Then you've got your system called interface to the kernel, which is how the user mode interacts with the operating system. And your operating system provides a number of functionalities. We'll be going through all of these as uh, through this course. Right? So we'll be going through CPU scheduling, uh, memory management, I.O. device management, uh, how is our signals handled? Signals are an important concept. Uh, and then there's a kernel interface to hardware, which you will not most likely be dealing with. Most people don't have to deal with these things. This is what the device drivers, people who actually build the hardware, uh, deal with. So they get it to the point at which uh, your favorite hardware, right? X can interact with the OS. From that point onwards, it's the OS that exposes a specific interface that then you can work with. So even people who modify OSs don't necessarily always deal with this interface. Right? So this interface is less common than the interface that the user mode has. And with that, we conclude uh, this segment of the first week. So now you know how system calls in general work. The next thing you'll be talking about is interrupts.